Okay, it's game time. Shoot. Get down! Hasta luego. Feast on this! What up, it's Shinkster94, and a huge welcome to my new weapon review of Resident Evil Village, also known as Resident Evil 8, in 4K Ultra HD. This is the first weapon review on the channel to be in this amazing resolution, and I'm going to be calling back to one of my channel's most iconic moments from my Resident Evil 4 HD weapon review at some point. The dedicated fans and subs can probably guess at what I'm referring to. What they also know is as per ritualistic weapon review routine, I have quite a bit to talk about before before I begin showcasing the weapons of this fantastic looking game. So in my arrogantly careless tone, if you're an impatient little tick who couldn't care less about some important details and the layout of my weapon reviews, here's a timestamp to skip to the start of the showcase. I'll also pin the timestamp in the comments for you so you can one click to the action. Be advised however, if it's my voice and commentary that ends up rubbing you wrongly, you might as well hit back now because I've commentated in my videos since the very beginning of my channel's 11 year history and will gladly continue forevermore. If none of that jargon matters to you, please stick around. Now one thing I need newcomers to understand is that my weapon reviews are mostly showcases and aren't detailed with the weapon statistics. I don't have the time or patience to do the dedicated research required to effectively detail that stuff. Over the years, some people have tried to convince me otherwise, but they'll just never understand that that's not how I roll. That's it for the disclaimers, now let me talk about the game for a tiny bit. Resident Evil Village runs on the same proprietary game engine as the previous three main Resident Evil releases, Resident Evil 3 Remake, Resident Evil 2 Remake, and Resident Evil 7 Biohazard. The camera style is the same as the latter, returning to first person perspective. The inventory, on the other hand, throws back hardcore to Resident Evil 4 with the unique Tetris style grid. Another couple major throwbacks to the series staple game is the return of an in-game merchant, referred to as the Welcome. Duke in Village, and upon inspection, he can upgrade individual weapon statistics, just like the merchant from Resident Evil 4. Furthermore, the weapon part customization system from Resident Evil 2 and 3 remakes is also carried over. With all of this considered, in my opinion, this game is a hybrid of Resident Evil 4, Resident Evil 7 Biohazard with a splash of the remakes. That being said, this weapon review will incorporate tactics and reviewing styles from all of my weapon reviews of the aforementioned games. Now let me go into more detail with that and also discuss my weapon review routine. This is great for both potential newcomers to my weapon reviews and for dedicated fans who like seeing past content because I like to feature snippets from past reviews. For this review specifically, I'm going to use snippets from my weapon reviews of RE Engine titles only. So before showcasing, I sort the weapons into categories, usually starting with melee and handheld explosives. Then I move into the firearms, starting with the pistols, next submachine guns and assault rifles, then shotguns, sniper rifles, magnums, explosive artillery, then special weapons if the game has any. For each individual weapon, my first step is to examine it in the game's inventory menu and narrate its in-game description if provided. I'll provide emphasis if there's anything unique about the weapon or its description. If the weapon has custom parts, I'll also read the description of each of those. From there, I like to reveal the location of the weapon in game or the condition required to unlock it if it's an unlockable, as well as the location of its custom parts if it has any. This game follows Resident Evil 3 Remake as it features a store to buy unlockable weaponry using points earned in game for meeting numerous conditions. After looking the weapon and parts over and showing their locations, I'll proceed to test fire the weapon in a safe environment free of any enemies to avoid interruption. I always try to find a well-lit area so you can see the weapon very clearly. Something I will do to throw back to Resident Evil 4 and 5 is to test the weapon both with no upgrades and full upgrades, with the custom parts being excluded and included respectively. After testing the weapon out both ways, I'll share any opinions I have, if any, and then choose an enemy to test the current weapon on. I'll usually use the same enemy to test other weapons of the same category to compare damage results. Same with the initial weapon overview, I'll test the weapon both with no parts or upgrades, then once more with all parts and full upgrades. 
The enemy test results aren't conclusive as several variables must be considered, which is part of the reason I'm reluctant to be super detailed with these reviews. But you can use a formula I've been using for years if you really want to put a shot range on these test results, and that is add and subtract five from the number of shots the initial enemy test took. This really only applies to handguns and assault rifles for the most part though, so take it with a grain of salt. After the enemy test, I'll compare its shot amount to earlier tests of the weapon category, if any, share any final thoughts I have on the weapon, then announce the next weapon in the lineup. This is usually followed by an in-game cutscene featuring the weapon in use. Occasionally, I'll also test this seemingly overpowered weapon on a standard enemy to demonstrate the destructive capabilities, traditionally the most powerful magnum obliterating the head of one of the game's standard enemies. For this game specifically, the honor will go to the M1851 Wolfsbane Magnum against a Lycan for the details when we actually get to it. So there's a rundown of how this weapon review will go. If you made it this far, I profoundly appreciate your endurance, but wait no more. Let us finally begin this 4K ultra high definition weapon review. Alrighty then, I welcome you all to the hub of this weapon review. We'll be using this area because with this hole in the wall, it's very brightly lit here. Yeah, it's indoors and safe away from enemies. So, great place to overview the weapons. So, as usual, we'll be starting with the non-firearms. And the very first one, which typically begins all of my weapon reviews, is a very standard knife. Aha. Get that 4K resolution quality right there. Brightly lit and everything. And I could even zoom in, get the awesome detail. I'm not going to emphasize every single weapon like this. I'm just showing you guys the quality here. Alrighty, so reset it. So, a well-used knife with a large blade is as it's described. Okie dokie. And here it is equipped. So the first time you come across the knife will be in a brand new game. And when you enter the village for the first time, you'll eventually end up at this house over here. This is what it looks like in game. After you pass this in iron insignia door for the first time. Come in here. And the knife will be wedged into the desk. Here. You can pick it up. All right. Now, when I overview every single weapon, I'm going to test it normally, free of enemies. But I'm also going to show you guys the block animation because it gives you sort of another angle of the weapon when I do that. And also, sometimes when you use the weapon while blocking, he'll fire it one-handed instead of two-handed, depending on the weapon. All right. So, let's show off the knife real quick. And then you could also aim it like so. Similar to Resident Evil 7 Biohazard. All right, and then if I block, nothing really different about that. Okie dokie. So that's showing the knife really, not much to show. So I'm gonna test the knives and all the sub weapons for that matter on Morai K, which are those very basic zombie-like creatures you'll see. Nice. All right. So 21 slashes to defeat a Moraika. Now let's try stabs. Okay. So 14 stabs. So stabs produce a little more damage, apparently, than slashes. Makes a little sense, considering the stab is a much slower animation than the slash. So, it's up to you, what do you want to choose? Me, personally, I only use the knife as a last resort, maybe as a way to defeat enemies and conserve ammo when you're playing the game for the first time. Otherwise, I hardly use the knife against enemies. It's better fit for destroying crates and barrels and whatnot. All right, that is it for the knife. All right, now for the next knife, the Karambit knife. A distinctive combat knife with a slightly curved blade, great for close combat. 
All right. So you could almost argue that the first knife was a survival knife, and this is this game's combat knife. Definitely so, considering they actually used this knife for the first time playing as Chris in his section of the game, which is way later, spoiler alert. Anyway, the Karambit knife can be bought from the endgame store for 10,000 CP for Ethan to use in his sections afterward. Let's test it out. Okie dokie. So yeah, you definitely handled this knife a lot better than the regular knife. This one's definitely designed for combat. Now let's test this knife on a Moroika. Holy, three slashes compared to like the 22 the regular knife took. Holy shit! This is a really powerful knife. Now let's try the stab. So whether you slash or stab, it seems to take three hits from the Karambit knife to take down a Moraika. I did several tests there. A couple of them might have taken four when I just slashed like to hell. But yeah, three to four hits with the knife. This is an extremely powerful knife compared to the regular one. So I highly recommend giving this thing a try once you unlock it and buy it. All right, that is it for the Karambit knife. All right, now for the last close quarters weapon, the LZ Answerer. <laughs> a next generation weapon in development by BSAA with the blade made of charged particles that can slice through anything. Hold aim to activate double blade mode. Okay, so you're not seeing much right now from this inspection, obviously. So let me go ahead and equip it. There we go. Okay, you're still not seeing much. So essentially, this is a lightsaber from freaking Star Wars. And yeah, there you go. So the LZ Answerer can only be unlocked by playing Mercenaries mode and achieving double S ranks on all of the levels. And then it becomes available in the in-game store for purchase for 70,000 CP. So it is a tedious requirement to get this. It's very similar to Resident Evil 4's requirement to get the hand cannon, more or less. But yeah, once you have it, it is a neat little weapon, of course. So there's a lot to show with this one, but let's just basically test it out real quick. All right, see, as I held aim, it becomes a double blade. And Ethan literally switches between the two previous knives animations for both modes. Now, there's other things to show here. Well, of course, there's blocking, too. All right, so here's another cool feature. If you're aiming and you press the action button, you can change the color of the blade, and these actually have different effects. So from what I know, red deals a lot more damage, while green earns back health when you defeat enemies with it, but it's much weaker than the red mode. Blue, on the other hand, this is a defensive ability as it reduces the damage taken while blocking to practically zero. It reduces the damage quite a bit when blocking, so that's what blue is good for. For regular attacks, it's probably about the same firepower as a regular knife. All right, so let's go ahead and test this bad boy on a Moraika. Let's start with the red mode, since it's described as having the highest bit of power. Okay, so the thing is, there was two impacts in a single slash. So with that, it looks like two, maybe three slashes with the red LZ answerer for Amora Ika. Let's see if stabs make a difference. Well, that one stab hit 
hit the Moraika multiple times. Like, looked like two, maybe even three times right there. So you might have to be angled a certain way to get the multiple hits from this thing. All right, we got more more Moraika here. Let's switch the color up. Let's see how much damage blue deals. So about six slashes with the blue LZ Answerer. Because this one is more designed for defense. It's like you take less damage when you block against attacks with this color equipped. Now let's try the green. So this one earns back health. Supposedly, though, it's probably the weakest. We're gonna find out. Okay, so it took me 19 slashes to defeat the Moraika with a green version of the LZ Answerer. So clearly the different modes have very different damage rates and different attributes. It's like, if you have a lot of health to earn back, then I suppose you could use this the full way for the enemy like I just did. Otherwise, I really recommend using the red mode if your objective is to kill the enemy. Well, I'm not going to test the other colors with all the different slashes. We know the major difference between all the colors. I think that perfectly demonstrated the LZ Answerer. Alright, so let's see the d difference in damage taken when blocking attacks with the LZ Answerer. Took her about five hits to get me down to caution. So now, if I switch to the blue. Stay right there. So it decreases it a little bit, not a significant amount. It could be her attack that I'm blocking against. There are many different types of attacks throughout this game. Some enemies will put you down to caution with just one defensive hit because their attack is so powerful sometimes. It really probably depends on the enemy, but case in point, the blue is for defense, the green is for earning back health, and the red is for attack power. Alrighty. And that is gonna be it for that weapon. And that's also it for all close quarters weapons. All right, now we're moving into the sub weapons or throwing weapons, whatever you wanna call them. But anyway, getting into those, and the first one is the Pipe Bomb. A handmade pipe bomb. When thrown, it explodes violently upon impact or after a set amount of time. Alrighty. So here it is in game. Blocking. All right, let's go ahead and test it out. All right, so it's definitely an explosive type of throwing weapon, just like a hand grenade, more or less. So let's go ahead and test this out on a group of Moraikas. All right, so this one that was right near the blast radius got decimated in one, one charge. The other one, which was much further away from the blast radius, yet was affected by it, is still kicking. So let's see how many more far blasts she could take. How irritating. All right, she's still kicking. That was funny. We got Dummy Trust joining the party. Oh, freaking Dummy Trask interference. All right, so three pipe bombs with a far blast radius. So yep, there's your range with pipe bombs when it comes to Moraika. One to three. Pretty good. It's like as long as it can defeat enemies in one blast, it's a decent powered sub weapon. All right, that's it for the pipe bomb. Now for the next sub weapon, the mine. A direct contact mine triggers an explosion when stepped on. Possible to retrieve them after placing. Okie dokie. Now, it's pretty self-explanatory, and this isn't the first time we've seen a mine type of weapon. So let's go ahead and test it out. We'll place it right in the center of the room here. 
Now, my own proximity isn't going to trigger it, so the only way I could blow this up is by hitting it with a weapon of some sort. It's quite an explosion. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna chain them, kind of like Resident Evil 5. The exit's underwater. And it should be quite an explosion. Woo! Okie dokie. So that's testing out the mines. Now let's see how they work against enemies. All right, so just like the pipe bomb, the mine appears to deal about the same amount of damage. So the pipe bomb and the mine probably produce the same exact explosion, they're just used differently. One you throw and the other is based purely on proximity. Just different strategies, but more or less the same explosive. Okie dokie, so that's going to be it for the mine. All right, now for the next sub weapon, the hand grenade. A hand-thrown grenade that explodes after a short delay. Okay, everyone pretty much knows what a grenade is at this point. But anyway, this is separate from the pipe bomb in terms that only Chris can use this in his section. So let's go ahead and check it out with Chris here. Alright, well that's basically all there is to show with this, so let's go ahead and test it on a crowd of lichens. Alright, so that one grenade made short work of about four lichen. Definitely a good weapon, and has a typical use, good for crowd control, good to get them off of you if they're storming you and not giving you a way out. Alright, that is it for the hand grenade. All right, now for the next sub weapon, the flash grenade. A hand-thrown grenade that releases a bright, blinding light upon impact. <laughs> Didn't see that coming. All right, well, let's go ahead and test it out. I blind myself in the process. And let's go ahead and take this opportunity to test it on a pack of lichen. Look at all these stunned lichen. Alright, so yeah, the flash grenade is not a weapon that is able to kill anything. You can only stun. So, that's demonstrating it for you guys. So, that's gonna conclude the flash grenade and basically all non-firearms. However, there is one thing I'm gonna show while I'm here in Chris's section. Now for what I'll consider the last non-firearm. The target locator. A laser targeting device used to track targets. Targeting must be held until shells drop. Okie dokie. So with the shape of this, this is the same exact shape as the LZ Answerer. I just realized they used the same model for that thing. But anyway, what this is for, you can only use it during Chris's section, of course. And it is used specifically for your objective. So there's only one way to demonstrate this. There's no testing it out. We're just going to use it. Here we go. And that is how the target locator works. Uh, you just have to do this a couple more times to defeat this thing. And then you'll use it a couple more times against the boss fight that Chris has to endure a little after this. But that's all I'm going to demonstrate with this weapon. So that is it for the target locator, as well as all sub-weapons and non-firearms.